Okay, uh, let's start today uh, this new chapter, Living Together. Uh, that's all of the slides. <laughs> so, uh, I, I want to start with uh, Robert Axelrod's uh, papers. So, he's a political scientist. Uh, and actually, uh, you might call him also a complexity scientist. Do you see? So I, I want to start reading uh, this paper together, if it's okay with you. So how co cooperation emerges. Uh, <coughs> okay. So let's uh, let's go to the paper. Uh, it's a science paper and so the problem is that uh, you theory of evolution is quite individualistic theory right like you you do if you are fittest you will survive okay then uh, it doesn't make sense it, at first glance, it seems like there is no room for cooperation. Do you understand my point? Uh, so, how it emerges, where it comes from? Uh, one, one typical mechanism is uh, due to Dawkins. I, I'm sure you, you know about his book, Selfish Gene. Uh, yes, the Richard. Uh, I haven't read it, but I totally get the message. <clears throat> so let's briefly talk about what uh, the message is. Do you know the message in that book? Can you tell me? So uh, there is this thing called kin selection, right? So let's say... Uh, I will not draw something very interesting, but let's say these are birds, okay? And uh, let's say they are relatives. They are coming from the same grandmother or something, okay? So uh, let's say the information that this bird was supposed to transfer after mating is G, like genetic information, okay? Since they are relatives, uh, let's say there are, uh, they all have some proportion of this information that it was supposed to transfer. Are you following so far? Do you have any question? So, uh, let's, let's then have a predator. This is the predator. <laughs> and uh, Sometimes when the predator comes, uh, this bird would shout, predator is coming, okay? And uh, it will jeopardize its own life, right? What is the biological word for that? Being sacrificial. Have you heard of... Yes. Uh, okay, uh, it's an altruistic behavior. Uh, it sacrifices itself. But uh, can we still make sense out of this? Uh, if by sacrificing itself or jeopardizing its own life, uh, it saves, for example, 20 uh, of its relatives that all have 10% of its genes, then it's actually copying itself twice. Do you see the point? Yes, everyone? So, uh, basically, uh, cooperation, one, this is one mechanism of cooperation or self-sacrifice, uh, but <coughs> the, uh, this paper claims that there is 
another mechanism also which pushes the system towards cooperation. Okay, let's read from here. To account for the manifest existence of cooperation and related group behavior, such as altruism and restraint in competition, evolutionary theory has re recently acquired two kinds of extension. These extensions are broadly genetical kinship theory. This is what we just mentioned. Okay? Do you have a question? And reciprocation theory. That's uh, the main point of this paper, the reciprocation. So, uh, let's see, for example, here. Conspicuous examples of cooperation, although almost never of ultimate sacrifice, also occur where relatedness is low or absent. So you cannot explain that one with genetic kinship. Are you following? Yes or no? Mutualistic symbiosis offers striking examples such as these, the fungus and algae, algae I, I don't know how to read it, that compose a I don't know either how to read this one. Uh, so let's let's look at this. The ants and ant acacias, where the trees house and feed the ants, which in turn protect the trees. Uh, and the fig wasps and fig tree, where wasps, which are obligate parasites of fig flowers, serve as the tree's sole means of pollination and seed set. So this is basically an interspecies kind of game theory where uh, they are cooperating for a reason. Notice that, uh, th for example, what could fig wasps do is to uh, kill the tree completely, but they don't do it, right? Because uh, they, uh, they need the tree and tree needs the wasps, etc. Okay, so we, we will now talk about prisoner's dilemma. Have you heard of it? Yes, do you have a question? No, I just heard it. Yes, you, have, you just heard it. Anyone who, else? Does it know that there are two prisoners in prison? Yes. Yes. Uh, let me, I had a cartoon here taken from somewhere. This one? No, not this one. This one. There you go. So, <clears throat> this is the typical cartoon that you will find in Prisoner's Dilemma. So, uh, we are not uh, finished with this paper. We will come back to this prisoner. Uh, the whole thing is based on Prisoner's Dilemma. Okay. So, the point is that you can cooperate, which is here designed as confess, cooperate, or defect, okay? Let's see. If both of them cooperate, they get... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. Cooperation between A and B in this case is to remain silent. Are you following? And defection is to confess. So, if they both cooperate, they get one year of jail time. If they both defect, they get five years of jail time. If A confesses and B cooperates, then uh, B gets a very sad result, right? So if, if we turn into this paper, this is much better explained here. So this is player A and player B. What did you just say to him? So, <clears throat> here what you see is the prisoner's dilemma game, the payoff to player A. What is the result, uh, the payoff? Do you know what payoff is? Hmm? The benefit, yes. The benefit to player A. Okay? So if player A cooperates, 
So let's see. Let's say player B cooperates. What is a better choice for player A? So player B cooperates. What is the better choice for player A? For himself. This one. Defection, right? If, uh, if it defects, if player B defects, what's the better solution for player A? Defection again. Do you see the dilemma? <coughs> so if they know these rules, both of them would choose defection because that's the better choice given any choice the other makes. However, interestingly, uh, both if they both defect, they get a uh, payoff of one, but if they both cooperate, they get payoff of three. What are, are those periods? What, what are they named? Uh, well, <clears throat> it's in this paper, it's just uh, de uh, defined as S is the sucker's payoff. <laughs> okay? So these are uh, payoffs for player A, right? Yes, payoffs for player A. And they are symmetric for B. I mean, you, you, you need to change accordingly. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any questions so far? Do you see the dilemma here? <laughs> no, no. It's better to not know, you say. Oh, cool. So, by assumption P is greater than S, that's why he de defines this P and S. P was what? Punishment for mutual defection. Okay. Uh, and S is sucker's payoff. So, it pays to defect if the other players defect. Thus, no matter what the other player does, it, it pays to defect. But if both defect, both get P rather than the larger value of R that they both could have gotten had both cooperated, hence the dilemma. So how do we solve this dilemma? So they, <coughs> they introduced new perspective here, okay? In a bi biological context, our model is novel in its probabilistic treatment of the possibility that two individuals may interact again. That's when it... Uh, so if you are playing this game, uh, this prisoner dilemma once only, then it's always better to defect. Okay? But if you will uh, encounter the same organism again and again, then uh, it turns out that cooperation is better because there is a chance of building a trust between you two. You understand the point? Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, and this is also important. Our analysis of the evolution of cooperation considers not just the final stability of a given strategy, but also the initial viability of a strategy in an environment dominated by non-cooperating individuals, as well as the robustness of a strategy in a, I don't know how to read this, environment composed of other individuals using a variety of more or less sophisticated strategies. So there are three things that they consider uh, okay, let me not go there. So now I want to ask you, the creative students of Bilkent, uh, if we were to play this game in our daily life, what would be your strategy? Do you understand my question? Mm -hmm. Like, so, in a logical sense, if you are a computer, then you shouldn't play all together problems, because you are going to lose money in the long term. Yes. Then you, you know, you have to do the calculation with respect to probability. Okay. The probability is not going to work. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the same. Then you just look at the whole thing uh, 
as like like a computer, like I don't know, probable device, then you should always check because that's the only that's like the if conditions tell you to do that. But no matter what, you although we all know that we are going to lose money in the long term playing the lottery, we play it because the gain is much higher that somehow it's it's all of the calculations and all although you know the bit you play, so although we know that defecting is better here. Mm -hmm. So if 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 you de keep defecting people, people will remember that. Remember that here you don't uh, see the person once; you see them every day or every other week, right? But then you, keep, you can still keep defects. So once you keep funny, once you defect, that's a very good keep, point. That's a very good point. Actually, if the game, uh, the number of games is finite and you know it from the beginning, then all defection is a good strategy. But let's try something else, okay? Do, do you... Well, if, yeah, if there's only one game, it makes sense. Uh, but for example, let's say restaurants. In Turkey, for example, in some cases, they try to screw the uh, customers. So at first, they get one or two or three. Yes. Yes. Customers, but in the long term they always close. But if you start with a like mutual basis, like you don't try to secure these customers, you gain our customers. Yes. So if the um, the benefit is small, if you play it in long term, in long term it will pay up because you will survive as a restaurant. So would you then would you then uh, choose to cooperate always? It should be something like a trade, like it shouldn't be robbery. If it's a trade, I'm getting something in return. Yes. I will cooperate. Then, then what if you, okay, let's say you are in a restaurant. So let me just, because it's not heard from here. So you say that, let's say there is a restaurant uh, that uh, increases the price. By the way, this game theory has to do with economics, right, also the Nash equilibrium, etc. So let's say the prices are high. That's the way of defecting you, yeah. right? And uh, they defect you, but uh, next time you don't go. But that's, uh, let's have a better example. Let's say uh, two friends playing uh, this prisoner's dilemma without any physical attachment to it, okay? Uh, let's say you always cooperate you choose to always cooperate, and the last time uh, you you came together, he defected. That way, you got suckers fail. Okay. Then you will defect to him. Yeah, because you next time, right? But what if the next time you defect, he actually cooperates? What will you do next? Yes. I think it depends on the number of games you are going to play and the, uh, for example, if it's like, let's say, like the cartoon you showed, when, yes. when you don't cooperate, it's one year. Yes. When someone affects other mm -hmm. Let's say if you are going to play it five times, I think defecting all of you, but that's more for Cynthia and you. Like. But once the number of the games increases, mm -hmm. then I think you should cooperate. Once the number of games increases, you should cooperate, you see. And Elvin, what's your comment? Yes. Then the point where the when the damage failed uh, to maximize then you always defect. Yes. Uh okay. So what uh Robert and his friend did again by let me remind you that they will look to robustness 
stability and initial viability of this algorithm. And what they did is, uh, they conducted a computer tournament for the prisoner's dilemma. They invited game theorists in economics, sociology, political science, and mathematics, etc. Uh, so, and there was a winner, a clear winner. Okay, uh, a winner. The algorithm is very simple, proposed by Professor Anatol Rapoport. And the algorithm's name is tit for tat. So, uh, but it has uh, <coughs> some point in it. Initially, the first time they meet, it cooperates. Okay. The next time, it does whatever the other did last time. Do you, do you see? Like we were approaching that algorithm, but I like the fact that. Um, so basically, cooperation has to do with trust, and defection has to do with security, right? Military, like you are securing yourself from getting suckers pay off, right? So I, I like the fact that the ultimate gain is reached when you are just a little bit towards trust and right in the middle, right? So. Whenever the other defects, the next time you defect. Whenever the other cooperates, the next time you cooperate. But you initially start with cooperation. And that algorithm won all possible tournaments. They, they, they say all, all kinds of tournaments here. They had second round, etc. And I really recommend you to read this paper, the whole thing. They, they have applications both to social sciences and to biology itself. Do you have any questions here? Yes. So. Well, does this paper refer to the price equation at any point? Uh, who? Uh, I, I don't know what price equation is. Price equation is an equation that proves that uh, cooperation and kindness are evolutionary uh, products. Uh, what, what is the year of? Hmm. Maybe it has to do with genetically, uh, genetic uh, part of this cooperation, is it? Yes. yes. Uh, so this is another kind of emerge uh, mechanism for ev emergence of cooperation. Does it make sense? So maybe they don't. Well, I don't understand how this is. So, for example, this does what the other did to the game before, right? Yes. So let's say, but it starts with cooperation. Yes. So let's say there is a guy who is doing all defects against this strategy. So the first round, the all defect guy would win. Then they would go even all the way, wouldn't they? Yes, but uh, that's a very good question. And you are right, but uh, that's two guys. But think of the whole society. Okay. Uh, no, uh, it's in. The, that's a very good point. Uh, <coughs> probably the tournament uh, tournament is done in the following way. So each time you randomly pick two guys and their strategies you put them together that's how you actually meet the, the the other algorithm for the first time right so so what yes 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 so yes if you are talking about two individuals all defect wins Right, and and uh, they actually have that point in the paper. Uh, somewhere here, like they they actually want tit for tat is not in fact all D is evolutionarily stable no matter what is the probability of interaction continuing. 
Okay? This raises the problem of how an evolutionary trend to cooperative behavior could ever have started in the first place. And uh, one, of the, one of their propositions is that it could have started with kinship kind of uh, cooperation. So basically once the idea of cooperation is in, uh, in carved in your genes, uh, because of kinship, uh, because of the, because of this, because of this altruism. Once you have some kind of altruism in yourself, uh, that could be, it uh, could make you a more, you know, I don't know how, non-defective and cooperative organism. genes of the fetus just are transferred to the next system, Yes. Right? So this altruism, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but it will make 20 copies of 10% of its genes, which means it will copy itself twice. But the, all of the other ones would also be transferred to the next ones, would you say? Who yes, say? And, and they are uh, genetically kin, so they, they are uh, close to each other. Or, or let's think of uh, a mother bird protecting the eggs from fox. Okay? Uh, do I need to explain what's happening there? No. Yes? But I think we do the proportion the same as proof of your siblings groups for eight different hundreds of those organisms. Mathema can you repeat the question? If you think about next generation, uh, two of your siblings reproducing the same as you're reproducing for eight of your hundreds. But yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So you are answering to his question. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Okay, so that's where this uh, cooperation starts and goes on. Yeah. A single line, maybe for example, you can hunt the elephant, but if you're 16 or 16, you can hunt the lion. So, even if there's no kinship, doesn't it make sense to you? Uh, yes, exactly. So, that's the kind of reciprocity kind of cooperation without kinship. You are just together because you are going to take the reward of cooperation. But what could happen is that once you uh, uh, take down the animal, one of the lions, the stronger one, would like uh, say that this is this meat all belongs to myself. But then the other nine lions can kill <laughs> That's the point, so... <laughs> because it's nine of them. So it's always having high number wins. And not always, but yes. in all of yes. the Yes, but they might not, they might be scared like one of them would be scared of, let's say the the lo the one with lowest fitness would say that I don't want to find this big lion. Uh, okay, so it's complicated. Okay, let me uh, tell you what we are doing today. One more time, we are looking at a simulation of a certain uh, like multi-agent simulations, okay? This is what we are looking at. When you don't have just two agents or ten, you actually have hundreds of agents and they are interacting with each other and certain strategies come out. Okay, uh, let, let me briefly talk about uh, one other paper from Axelrod, if it's okay with you. It's, yeah, I just like the idea. The dissemination of culture, a model with local convergence and global polarization. Okay. Uh, here, what Axelrod thinks about is the following. So let's say uh, you are living inside a square and they are cells and you have neighbors. Okay. And... <clears throat> 
each uh, each cell can correspond to a village or a human being doesn't matter they have neighbors and uh, the culture of the village is defined by some number of traits like uh, whether their taste in music their taste in uh, kitchen uh, I don't know how they dress etc okay Th these are the number of traits how, ma how many different traits there are and let's say uh, there can be let me read from here and there are some number of features so uh, meaning that one of uh, the villages could have these numbers sorry this is uh, the numerical values has no meaning the, the, the one means that that village likes jazz whatever kind of village that is uh, and <laughs> a nice village uh, nice will and the other village n likes classical music okay <laughs> uh, and you know like these are just numbers and his idea is that uh, let's have another village and let's say there is another village that likes jazz too okay so basically, Axelrod chooses two two neighboring villages each time, and compares a certain trait. So let's, for example, compare the, their taste in kitchen. Okay, let's choose this one and this one. Uh, do they have common features? No. Then they just, uh, do you like banana? No, I don't like banana. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, and uh, then some other day, again they meet. This time they don't talk about kitchen, they talk about music. Okay? Once they see that they have common traits in music, they have... Uh, something to share so they sit for another drink right and in the meantime one of the guys talks about the way they dress and the other one likes it okay so let's say this is the other guy and then this number seven here becomes five okay so you have two strings if you have common string you pick the strings randomly, so uh, the probability of them being equal is cl uh, is similar to uh, the closeness of you two, cultural closeness. Okay, and then uh, basically, if you start running this program, do you understand how the program uh, works? Yes, that's a very good point. Their positions are stationary. So you interact always with the same neighbors. So all of these features are determined randomly, right? Randomly. You start randomly. Okay. Is it possible to get one village and all of its neighbors share no properties? Yes, that's the whole point. And the idea is that, uh, so you start from random <coughs> initial condition and let's say you you start uh, some village starts to <coughs> gain popularity around among its neighbors it it disseminates its culture to others okay so but like they merge them, so. yes yes because the closer their cultures are the more it is possible for them to yeah. yet because, become uh, even more closer and the non-closer they are, it's 
possible for them to remain non closer. But if they can't get more distance, they can only get more close from the absolute. Uh, let me think about it. Yes, actually, you are right. But uh, there is something. Uh, <coughs> actually, that's a very good point. That's that's what's missing from this model. We can re redefine this model in the following way. Just one moment. If they are not equal, okay, then then they should look for their <laughs> equal traits and change them. But that's not included in this model, okay? So uh, let me take your questions and. Yes. Uh, in each culture, yes. uh, that can avoid this, uh, uh -huh. that can create this divergence. Yes, maybe. When they are similar, because that's kind of things happen in culture. Sometimes the same. Yes. Sudden change happen. Exactly. Uh, now it's different from the previous one. And once, once you have, for example, a culture A and a culture B that has nothing in common, they will share a border but they will never interact. Yeah. So the idea probably was that maybe we could start with randomness and then produce some regions, okay? And that would be the model for cultural dissemination. Starting all this no, no, no. Uh, we, that's the whole point. We don't have globalization here yet because it's just nearest neighbors. Interacting. But still, nearest. Yeah, one far, uh, far from the other one doesn't. Yes, care. doesn't care. So. Uh, I'm curious about the one next to you, but I understood the one next to you. Yes, <laughs> yes, of yes. course. There's no interaction. Direct, like direct no, no direct interaction. So, for example, I, I ran it for some time, mm -hmm. and this is what I got. Do you like it? But <laughs> uh, yes, uh, but I don't want to bother you with this. Uh, <clears throat> so, as you mentioned, what happens with the globalization? Actually, there was a nice YouTube video. Maybe I can just simply show it to you. Excel road model. Uh, this video, I really like this video, so let's watch it. It's one minute. So, <clears throat> you see that cultures appear, right? This guy is. <laughs> Now, equilibrium was reached. Next, 20 random links will be rewired and the simulation will be continued. So, now we will introduce globalization, meaning that some of these links will actually connect far away. Okay? Let's go ahead. Do you see the increase? Uh, I, I mean, we will mention this in a moment. What does this suggest? So, do you see that uh, after rewiring, there was an increase in cultural uh, difference? No, that's, there is a bit diversity, uh, right? Do we do we see that in our daily lives, like when the villagers watch YouTube videos in iPad, right? Uh, you can get any kind of culture now everywhere, right? But what happens next is, like, in the short term, there is an increase in diversity, but in the long term, there is a decrease in diversity. So everyone likes Burger King now. What? It decreases even more than the required. Yeah, exactly. It goes below. Uh, so the equilibrium decreased from 22 to 16. Yeah, you saw this big, big chunk that was produced here, right? Do you see? Yes. Okay, that's all I wanted to show. So global diversity decreased? 
globalization at first increases diversity. Yeah, diversity of the whole population. The whole population. But then it decreases the diversity of the whole population. Do you agree with this effect? Yeah, yeah. yeah. provided new teachers cannot be generated. Yes, because there is. Uh, yes. So we had X types of musics before. Now we have people that come from all sorts of different stuff. Music, someone like this. So what if I start introducing new teachers? And like, yes. It doesn't work, right? This model doesn't work. It doesn't assume that, but yeah. Why does that happen? Hmm? What? Why the decrease happens? We introduce more richness into the local scale. Because. Uh, Let's say there is a very stable culture somewhere, a big, very stable culture, and once some distant parts can interact with, the, with that culture, rather than changing that culture, they will be changed. And the other regions will also become yellow. That's nice. Yeah. I actually had uh, a 1D model of it. Do you want me to go through this code? No, you don't want to see the code. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just run it. It's. I I can sell this one also as a as an art piece of art. So, this model is actually one dimensional. Okay, what you see here are different villages. Okay. And the colors, so here you have five, uh, no, 10 features and, and 15 traits. So there is no interaction with the light, it's 1D. It's 1D, yes. It's just neighbors. And I think here I, I just have two neighbors, like the one to the right, the one to the right of the right. Uh, I mean, four neighbors. The one to the left, the one to the left of the left. And they're also Yes. So let's run this again. Do you see this nice interaction? Yes. But no culture dominates the one to the right. Actually, interestingly, if you increase the number of villages that are interacting, then, then the, the, the possibility of domination actually increases. Yeah. Okay? And let me show you. Uh, the same conclusion from Axel Road. It's like globalization is when you can reach quality. But you are not increasing the neighbors. You are just increasing the number of villages. The neighbors yeah, are so stay the same. You, you just increase the number of villages you keep having, right? So no. The number of villages that one village interacts says, stays the same, but you increase the total number of villages. Then uh, let me show you a similar plot from Axel Roth's paper. And this is also a very nice read. I, I really recommend you to read it. But you will not, right? So there you go. Width of the territory, as it increases, there are less and less regions, OK? So why is this happening? Let me try to show it, it to you in this 1D model. If I increase it to a thousand, notice that, for example, for a certain region to settle, it needs to have all these different lines uh, come together. So this one was a bad run. I need to show you the... So do you see this region will not settle for a long time because they need all these different borders to come together for them to settle. The longer they stay in this uh, undecided state, uh, the more they have a possibility of changing their neighborhood, etc. Do you have any questions right now? So let's have a break. <laughs>